Welcome to another Axe Church podcast. Glad you're with us today. Today I have uh, Pastor Dave with me again. My name is Hunter Croft. I am on staff here at Axe Church. Um, by the way, if this is your first podcast, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Uh, you can go back and listen to, this is our, our 17th podcast, so you have got 16 more that you can listen to after this. Uh, congratulations. That's always not the best when you find a show that everyone's loved for a long time and there's just all these episodes that are just ready to be watched is, by you that is amazing like netflix or whatever yeah yeah i'm not sure this one qualifies but hey if you think it does <laughs> you should tell your friends yeah yeah and you know share share this podcast on social media or let your friends know about it if you think it's been helpful or worth listening to or helps you fall asleep at night any of those things are <laughs> reasonable uses for the x church podcast so uh yeah today we're going to talk about a couple of things uh most recently you know in the news we had uh ireland the country of ireland it's an island n- next to uh britain um or i guess what is it part of britain it's I, tar- part of the uk i'm not sure geographically well if it's northern connected. ireland is still part of the uk ireland itself the Republic of Ireland is its own country for our Irish listeners. Um, forgive me if I make any mistakes here. Um, and and there's always some um, danger in getting into the politics of other countries, but yes. hey, <laughs> and that's never stopped me before. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, what happened recently in Ireland and some other things. Before we get started, though, we'll, uh, as we usually do, I'll just catch up. Hunter, how's, how has your week been? It's been good. It's been, uh, Taylor's been recovering from her wisdom teeth. My wife, Taylor, has been recovering from her wisdom teeth removal. She's been doing well. Um, Do you find that she's somewhat less wise now? Or uh, Yeah, it's it, she used to be have lots of good things to say. Now, all of a sudden, it's like the wisdom just... Or at least she's more like, I wrote, 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 because of the thing. It no, I was, I was really hoping for a lot of that, but as soon as the gauze came out of her mouth, she was What do you mean herself. you were hoping for a lot of that? I just thought it'd be funny. Oh, okay. I just wanted to laugh at it. I was going to say, be careful. Um, you're, you're hoping that you wouldn't be able to hear your wife talking. It's not a <laughs> that is not what I said. No, it's, well, it's what I heard. <laughs> no, that's untrue. Um, she's, she probably doesn't get to talk much around you anyway because you talk so much. So. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, Except for her uh, Facebook live presentations that she does, which I haven't seen yet, but I have seen that she does. Them, it's, so. it's It blows my mind that she does it because everything about hers is uh, introverted, don't talk to people. And then all of a sudden she's like, I'm going to start selling stuff online with Facebook Live. And I was like, you're never going to, you're, you're going to get the camera in front of you and you're going to freeze and you're going to turn it off because you hate talking. Right. But she does it. And, uh, yeah, she does. I see it. I see her on there all the time. It's a lot of fun for her. So yeah, good. That's, uh, and her sister. That's good stuff. So yeah. So she got her wisdom teeth out, mm-hmm. um, which is, I, that happened for me a long time ago. It was actually, I believe the last time I was at the dentist. Um, so that tells you how horrible it was yeah. for me. It was just, this was many, many years ago, <laughs> probably 16 years ago. Um, and they had probably needed to come out for a while before I ever got them out. And, you know, it was, it was somewhat harrowing. The doctor, uh, we had a dentist that was, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, let's just say it, he was not a butcher, but something very close to that. He, and he might have had the same skill set. It, it was, <laughs> yes. I think he could have done some cross, you know, between butchering and, and dentistry. No offense. One of my one of my best friends is a dentist, and he's not a butcher. And I he wasn't a dentist yet when I had this done, or I would have had him do it. But it was it was pretty horrible when they're – and they didn't put me out, you know. I don't, just, I don't generally think dentists are the ones doing these – Extraction. You mean like oral surgeons? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, this was not the case. You just had a dentist do it? If he was even that. Oh, wow. I don't think think that any dentists do wisdom teeth extractions anymore. No, really? I think it's always a special surgeon. You can can comment uh, on this post and let us know if you still extract wisdom teeth. But (laughs) this guy basically, it, it it was like, you've seen the medieval torture. Um, yeah, or yeah. whatever, and they pull out like the the thing with like the tools and the way. This was kind of like that. They didn't they didn't put me under. They didn't even give me like the laughing gas stuff or whatever. I've never had that. Um, it was just like local, uh, local yeah, anesthesia. Just just like uh, Novocaine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he pops some Novocaine in, which of course that hurts too. And I had had to go because one of my teeth had basically. I was in incredible pain, uh-huh. right? So, so the first thing is I call this. I'm, I I didn't have a dentist, so I'm like looking in the phone book for a dentist, uh, like at night. Um, What's and, a phone book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh bless you. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. What's a phone book indeed? So yes, back then we used phone books. Um, 
And I, you know, I'm looking at the phone for a dentist because I need to find somebody like at nighttime because I'm in this incredible pain. So I call this dentist. He answers the phone, oh. like his cell phone or whatever. And he prescribes me like narcotics, like over the phone. He's never met me. Like this is what it was like. This is how, that's how long ago this was. He said, like, I go in, you know, get these things and then come see me in the morning. I'm like, okay. So I went and got these pills and so that I would not die because I was in, in t- enormous pain. And I go <clears throat> and I go into his office the next day. I was living in California at the time. We had uh, some insurance that probably did not get me the very highest uh, quality folks around. And so I go into this guy's office. He's got like, you know, a number of different rooms for people. And he would just put them in the rooms and then just go around, right? Um, Line room up to and room. Out. Yep. And so he Novocaine's me up, he comes back in, sticks the pliers back there, or whatever, just starts yanking, right? Ugh. And there's like blood like squirting out of my mouth uh-huh. onto this guy's, you know, uh, you know, whatever he's wearing. And he has to break one of my teeth in half. So you're hearing this bone break uh-huh. in your oh. in your jaw, and uh. he's yanking it out. It was it was wonderful, <laughs> just a delicious experience. Uh, and then of course I was just incredibly fearful for the next hour long that I was going to get dry sockets, which yeah, yeah. I've heard are incredibly painful. I did not get dry sockets, but it was pretty pretty harrowing. <clears throat> I was in law school at the time. And I went to law school for a little while in, in a school in California before I went to. Virginia uh, for law school and and so yeah this was this was not fun and not fun at all and so I feel bad for your wife except for the fact that she at least got to be put under and didn't experience right. the bone rattling you know people yanking yeah you know bones out of her face and so yeah um, good times very good times <laughs> for me so <clears throat> that's my wisdom teeth story I hope that uh, that you all have had better experiences in getting your wisdom teeth taken out. Of course, you can comment about that too if you want in the comments um, and uh, we'll hear your wisdom teeth stories. I also want to say that if you want to ask questions for us to answer on this podcast, uh, let's had a hashtag ready for it. Um, let's just say hashtag Axe Church Q and A um, and just write it all out. Hashtag Axe Church Q and A. If you do that on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you write a question in, we will get it and we might answer it on the podcast. So uh, we'd like to get some listener questions in, things that you want to hear uh, from us, and we will do our best to uh, do a podcast where we answer your questions about about Acts Church, about the Christian faith, about uh, any of the things that we've talked about, or anything in general that you that you uh, as a as a believer or someone who's who's uh, thinking about. Uh, the Christian faith or the or the truth claims uh, that Christianity makes. Go ahead and put those questions out. We'd love to answer them on the podcast. So do that. Meanwhile, let's talk about Ireland. And mm. Should we do the rest of it in an Irish accent just yeah, to offend everybody I, possible? I, I don't even have one. <clears throat> I don't either. I, had I a, wish I did. I had a, a coach in high school who lived in Ireland like for a couple of years when he was in his mm-hmm. 20s or something like that. And he had, we were, so we were the Shadow Park Highlanders. So okay. that's Scottish. That's more Scottish. But he right? would always do the Irish accent. Right. It, to a Which is a little more musical than the Scottish accent. I like the Scottish yes. accent a lot. The Irish accent, to me, the way I tell the difference is it just has more music. It's like the Lucky yeah. Charms guy, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's musicality. I think it. that's the uh, the stereotype of it. But yeah, um, yeah. And he would always he would talk in his Irish accent, and it'd be funny because you know we'd be you know Highlanders, and there'd be people in kilts walking around. So. Oh, you had people in kilts. Oh, there were, it, that was a that was a thing. We had a, a pipe band that uh, they played bagpipes and wore kilts, and they had like a drum line that wore kilts. And huh. It was it was pretty legitimate, I guess. To I me, guess. At least. it was to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was really that's, cool to me in ninth grade. Yeah. It was still kind of cool to me around twelfth grade. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I have never worn a kilt myself. Um, in me either. Actually, I never wore a kilt. I mean, you didn't have to wear them to do your cross country. And stuff no, but it probably would have helped. Probably it probably would have. Yeah, you would feel a lot more free. Yeah. Actually, um, technology and running shorts has come a long way. So since the kilt, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would think so. I would think so. Yeah. So uh, in, in any case, in Ireland, in the last week, they had, I believe, it was the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, had basically said, and, and I'm just going to paraphrase here. I don't have it in front of me that the life of an unborn child and the life of the mother were equal in value. That essentially, you know, we in the, in the United States, we have our constitution basically says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, all right, um, and, and property. You know, that's the that's sort of the 
the thing that you cannot take away from somebody without a proper process, right? The due mm-hmm. process of law. And so then the question then becomes things like, well, who does that apply to? Who who has the right to life without without uh, you know fear of having that taken away from them without due process? And so then does that extend to the unborn? Well, as most of you know, in the United States, the answer is that depends. Um, on, on, on a number of things. On how close they are to born. That's right. It, it depends on the state that you live in and right, right. a number of things. So <clears throat> different states have different laws. The Supreme Court has essentially uh, set out a a legal precedent that says that essentially we, we draw the line at, at viability. Um, and so essentially if a child can live outside of the womb, um, you can, as a state, you can make laws that are – much more strict about abortion post viability. So let's just let's just say that's twenty five weeks. Okay, mm-hmm. I don't you know. I think that we've seen um, children born viably at much less than that now. Uh, maybe even twenty two, twenty weeks. I'm not sure of the yeah. of the modern. And that's so. that's another interesting thing is that the the quality of medicine that that child can have access to right. determines Pe- how viable people they become are. people depending on uh, where medicine is at the moment, yeah. which can't be true, yeah. right? I mean, just from, a, just from a philosophical standpoint, we can't say that people are all of a sudden not people because medicine hasn't advanced long enough to have them be removed from their mother's womb and live. Yeah. Um, and certainly people can't be people based on the six inches between, uh, you know, from the uterus to being outside of the body of a mother. And yet we do have, uh, you know, we've had horrific things like partial birth abortion and and so on that have gone on in this country um and and this and this may be a difficult topic for some people so up front i just want to say <clears throat> we at axe church are not in the business of or interested in um, trying to shame anyone for your past and what's gone on in terms of if you've been in the position you've had an abortion um or you've been part of the decision making for an abortion we're not here to shame you and to make you feel bad uh, we believe that christ offers forgiveness and we believe that christ offers grace and we believe that that he wants to hold you in his arms and if that kind of thing has happened and you're suffering from that you know call us up email us uh, you know talk to us we'd love to counsel you through some of the pain that people go through after those experiences the idea that the average woman um who who goes through a process like uh, like abortion comes out of it with absolutely no regrets is just not true. Um, many, many people struggle a lot after that. And so, of course, we as, as Christ Church are here for you and are here to walk you through that and so on. And at the same time, I, we can't... Um, keep ourselves from being clear about what we know to be true from the natural moral law from scripture and so on concerning the value of the life of an unborn child. And so keep in mind that uh, as we go through this, you know, if this is hard for you, um, I, I get that. And, and you know, if, if, if this isn't a podcast for you to be listening to because of some things that have happened in your past, I understand that. But know that we're here uh, for you. There's also here in town, we have Pathways Pregnancy Center. Shout out to them. What a wonderful organization that will help um, mothers of who are pregnant. And if, if you need help, if you're struggling with these kinds of decisions, please go to them. They have great counselors. Uh, they provide uh, real practical help. Um, they're one of the things that, that people complain about, uh, the, the church and those who are um, pro-life, you know, right, if right. you want to put a political term on it, although I, I don't like political labels, but they say, well, are you going to adopt all these kids? And, and my answer is a resounding yes. We will. We'll adopt all those kids. Uh, the fact is, is that um, there, you know, that's that's a misnomer. There are so many families out there waiting to adopt children, uh, waiting to take care of these children. We have so many organizations uh, through organizations like CareNet. We have pregnancy resource centers all over the country. I, I was on the board of one in Tennessee when I was there. Um, these are wonderful organizations with people who care, men and women who just care about mothers and their children and families and want to provide practical help and want to provide um, you know, counseling. And, and even for those who have gone through an abortion who need counseling, these organizations provide that for them to help them walk through that process and come out on the other side like all of us, who all of us have sinned. All of us have made mistakes, and that's the scripture couldn't be more clear about that. And so, you know, we want you to know that that 
the Lord is here not to provide uh, judgment and, and harshness on you, but to provide for those who are willing to accept His forgiveness, um, to provide grace and peace uh, for those of us who have uh, who have made mistakes and who have sinned and who have missed the mark. And all of us, that's true for whether it's abortion or whether it's gossip or whether it's hypocrisy or whether it's whatever it is. And so, um, keep that in mind as we walk through this. But as we walk through it, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk, you know, pretty pretty frankly about this issue, and we may get into a couple other social issues, but in Ireland, Hunter, uh, what's happened is the Eighth Amendment gave this right. And so the question was, do we repeal this amendment? And by repealing this amendment, what would happen? Because essentially what this amendment did was made abortion illegal. It wasn't legal. And of course, the Catholic Church has had a strong, uh, obviously, for those of you who know anything about the history of Ireland, the Catholic Church has had a very strong, strong presence in that country. And of course, the Catholic Church is very, very against abortion. Mm-hmm. And so... This was this is being sort of hailed as not only rejection of, you know, uh, pro life principles, but a rejection of the Catholic Church. Mm. And I would say maybe that's true, and maybe that's not. I, I don't think that's true. We'll walk through that part in a minute. But let me let me get to what's actually happened. They did repeal it. Um, the Eighth Amendment has been repealed in Ireland, and it was by a pretty significant margin. It was in the sixties, I think, sixty something percent of the population said, "Yeah, let's get rid of this and essentially open up." Um, open up the path for abortion to be legalized in their country, which of course, you know, puts them with the quote unquote rest of the modern world in the sense that um, so many of the countries in the modern world do allow abortion. Uh, and so now Ireland has joined the ranks of, of those folks and they they have maybe or maybe not rejected the Catholic Church. What they have certainly rejected is uh, morality. <laughs> and what they have certainly rejected is uh, you know, standing against the rest of the modern world on an, on an issue that is truly a life and death issue, truly an issue of of the worst kind of, of cruelty to the most, um, you know, a precious <laughs> and the most innocent life that we know of among mm-hmm. humans, um, and the most vulnerable life. And so, you know, when we when we look back at what we've you know, what our cultures and what our societies look like. I think there's something, um, and people have said so before, you know, what is a society, how is a society treating those most vulnerable? Um, and we are not doing a good job of that with issues like abortion. Um, there are a number of other issues where we are not, you know, race relations. We have some real issues all over the world to deal with in that, including here in the United States. Um, we have issues in how we and how we deal with the poor that need to be dealt with in this country as well as all over the world. Um, and this is another one, you mm-hmm. know, unborn children. And so um, give me your thoughts on... And, and I want to, because you and I are, are have an age difference of, uh, you know, around 20 years or so, or I think only 17. about 17 years. Yeah. So I'm not that old. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 16 and uh, a half, actually. I'm young. I'm young. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to get your your view uh, and, and, and less your particular view, because I'm pretty sure I know, hope I know where you stand on this issue, but maybe the view of your friends and so on growing up um, with your kilt wearing friends in oh, Spokane. Yeah. Uh, you know, what have you seen among people on the issue because the abortion debate was really really big in the 80s it was a, a huge deal out of oh, yeah, I you know roe v wade was in the 70s into the 80s there was a huge uh issue with abortion it sort of it sort of took a different uh tactic and a different strategy into the 90s and into the 2000s and the way that people deal with it not as many people say chaining themselves to the front of abortion clinics and things like that but what's your experience with the the people your age and i'm just going to say people who are between the ages of say 18 and 25 um in has there been a consistency about the way people believe about this have you seen a change in it talk to me about that um yeah i think generally um, growing up, unless unless someone was a Christian, they probably um, were okay with abortion, I think. Um, you know, it's not exactly the type of thing that you bring up at your high school lunch table, but um, <clears throat> I think in general people were uh, pro, well, the, the, I'll say the political uh, term, pro-choice. Um, and... I would say that I, I and I engaged in a couple of debates with with people, and I probably picked the wrong people to engage with debates on because they were the least useful um, t- encounters I've ever <laughs> had. You know, um, I you know I, they were trying to say, oh, well, an unborn 
fetus is not a person yet. And I provided scientific articles uh, stating that there's actually some pretty good evidence that an unborn child is just as much human as as uh, you or I. And uh, their response was, well, we don't make up uh, we we don't make up the scientific facts. We just state them like they were trying to say that, oh, the science was supporting them, even though I was they had not posted any sort of uh, backing to their argument. They were just basically saying we're right and you're wrong because we think science backs us even though I was showing them that it didn't. Um, so uh, I... Boy, that's not good enough for you? Unfortunately, I have not had uh, the most um, positive interactions on this this topic because um, I think it's it's really uncomfortable to actually think about um, the, the ram- the, the, what it means if abortion is wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, I've, I've heard... I've heard arguments saying that, okay, abortion is, uh, an unborn child is a person, um, but it's better off that they, if, if it's an unwanted pregnancy, it's better off that they didn't have to live a life where they weren't intended to, to be brought into the world. They weren't intended. They don't have, maybe their mother won't be able to, uh, care for them financially or, or whatever. Um, or, or things like, uh, yeah, basically they'd have a low quality of life, and therefore, right, right. And so would the mother, right, right. And so why why bring this child in the world? Or, you know, you see a lot more these days. Oh, well, what if there's some kind of a birth defect or some kind of yeah, issue yeah, like that? yeah. So let's let's get a few things out of the way on just the science, so that we're all talking on the same level. And one of the things that's been confusing about this issue is it's it's like a lot of things. If you go and you get a high school biology book, okay. Mm-hmm. You are probably or possibly reading um, the state of the art from 15 or 20 years ago. You know, you're not necessarily getting because of the way that science works and because of how quickly it moves and because of um, how difficult it is to get from what's currently in peer peer reviewed journals into, say, a high school curriculum, Mm -hmm. um, the amount of time it takes to pass these things through and so on. You're rarely at the state of the art with science in your average high school uh, textbook, even more so in what, what I would call pop science, popular science, right? The, the, the things that people out there think they know about science. And so right. the debate back in the day was, it was definitely a language debate. And you'll see this, and for those of you who like to think uh, through issues that are difficult, one of the things that you will notice if you really pay attention is that people will use and manipulate language. And because it's powerful, because language is a symbol for ideas, and if you can, and if you can just change that symbol slightly, uh, you can change the idea slightly. And so things like the word fetus, mm-hmm. um, of course, it's a real word; it's a scientific term, but it has, but it does not mean that because something is a fetus that it is not a human, right? Right? Uh, it's a it's a it's description a of of a of stage humanity. of human development, kind right. of like toddler, yeah. Right, um, and, and so here's the deal. People are like, no, no, not baby, fetus, right? And so it, because let's get the language right because we're not killing a baby, we're killing a fetus. Now, hang on, a, a fetus is a baby, mm-hmm. okay? A fetus, a baby is simply a child prior to being a toddler, right? And so um, let's get the state of the science out. Here, here's the deal, and and feel free to argue with me all you want in the comments. We'd be happy to provide either in the show notes or or uh, through through a thoughtful debate within the comments under um, the postings uh, of this podcast, uh, the science, but the current science is essentially this. Uh, From the moment of conception, you have a human being. It is a human being. There's no question about that. That is no longer the state of the art argument amongst uh, philosophers and uh, and ethicists, um, which are just philosophers who deal with ethics, particularly um, those who are dealing with issues of morality within biology, bioethics, things like that. The state of the art debate is not about whether we're talking about a clump of cells, quote unquote, um, or a baby. That's that's out. That's done. That's been done for a long time. There's no question it's a human being. There's no question it's a baby that from the moment of conception, you are dealing with a human being, okay? That there's nothing to argue about there. If you're still having that argument, you're you are just 
uneducated about the science. And, and, and I'm not saying this to offend you. I'm saying this so that you will become educated so you can actually, when you're having a philosophical debate about the rightness or wrongness of things like abortion, so that you're on the right page. Right. It is a human being. Yeah. Now, the question has not become that. The question now, for those who are in the know and continue to support um, what, what they quote unquote call the, a woman's right to choose, and it, it depends which women, the woman in the womb or the woman outside the womb, right? But that's a whole different issue. Mm-hmm. Um, um, again, language is – when you say a woman's right to choose, everybody's like, whoa, 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 of course. I don't want to be taking people's choices away. We're all about freedom of choice American, and so on. Yeah. But no one talks about the woman's right to choose to uh, end the life of her four-year-old. Yeah. Right? That's that's not there. So when we're talking about the woman's right to choose, it really matters what she's choosing. A woman's right to choose where she works? Absolutely. A woman's right to choose who she marries? Absolutely. A woman's what right type to choose of ice cream she wants. <clears throat> anything, any Those any number of things. Of but but a woman's right to choose to end and quote unquote end a pregnancy rather than kill a baby, right? What the one side wants to say, a woman's right to choose to kill a baby. The other one's right to say ends the right to has a right to end a pregnancy. Well, they're both right. Mm-hmm. You are ending a pregnancy and you are killing a baby. Um, so let's just let's just take all the the language that causes. Um, everybody get up in in arms and let's just talk about the science. The science says you have a human being. So the argument has become not, am I killing a human being? Am I ending the life of a human being? The argument has become whose life is more valuable. That's Mm -hmm. what the argument has come down to. And that is a very, very dangerous argument. But Mm -hmm. let's talk about the argument first, okay? And you can find this. This is, look, just do a Google search. Just do some, instead of just talking and just giving your opinion and just and just doing that kind of thing, just take a little bit of time, breathe, go online and look this up. You'll find that I'm not making this up, okay? Um, the fact is, is that the argument today is about whether the mother's life is more valuable than that baby's life, okay? And because the baby is relying on the mother to grow in her womb, and to be birthed and so on, that the mother is in a position of of higher of a higher quality. You know, uh, it's not they're not equal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mother's the mother's right to decide whether to bring the pregnancy to fruition is the mother's choice, even though the the choice to quote unquote end the pregnancy is a choice to kill a human being. So that's really the argument. And there are those who just say simply, yes, I'm okay with the mother making that choice. It's a mother's choice to make. It's the it's the choice of the woman. And and even using the word mother, right, is questionable for some people because that of course suggests something about uh, what, the life what's of a human yeah, being. Yeah, yeah. But but we need to get away from all that because that's just semantics and rhetoric. The fact is, is that we are talking about a human being and ending a pregnancy is killing a human being. Okay, period. That's just the science. Mm-hmm. So now, now we go to, okay, where, where are you going to stand? Now we, now we open this world up. Like, it all comes back and, you, and you, you take a step back and you're looking at a much wider philosophy of life and worldview mm-hmm. about what you believe about the value of human beings, um, about what you believe about the value of life in general. Um, and so here, here the Christian uh, worldview is going to butt up very hard against what I'm just going to call uh, your smattering of basic postmodern worldviews that exist, many of which classify human beings as animals, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. you're, you're not talking about uh, a human being as being anything other than a slightly smarter animal than, say, a dolphin, yeah. Right? I mean, certainly you've heard that. Yeah, just this week, yeah. Okay, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I had a um, conversation where someone's like, oh, yeah, we're just... It was actually a, a debate on uh, vegetarianism and veganism, and they were like, yeah, anyway. Mm. I don't know why that was the way that they took the mm. argument, but that's where they took it. Was, oh, well, we're just- and those are, those are actually classic parts of this argument, mm-hmm. uh, of this, uh, the argument on abortion, um, are, are, are questions of, well, if we're talking about sentient beings, you know, why is it any more wrong for me to kill a cow than it is to kill a child? Mm-hmm. And my simple answer to that is because the child's mother is a human being. And the child is a human being, and a cow is not. Yeah. Um, and and here's why. And and so just so you know where believers are coming from, if you don't happen to be a a believer, uh, and and you don't or you don't fully comprehend the Christian worldview on this issue, we believe that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. That we are different in kind from animals. We are not the same thing. That we have body, soul, and spirit, and that those that those things are are. 
part of the makeup of us that is that is in the very image and likeness of God and that every human being has an intrinsic value that is incredibly important. You are not just a sack of meat walking around waiting for inevitable death and nothingness. That is just not what we believe. And we have really, really good reasons to believe that. And I can't, I mean, this would be a very long podcast if I went into all of that. So I want to stay on the topic um, right now of, of abortion and and where people are coming from. But I, but I want to analyze why is it that, that somebody could say, yes, it's a baby, okay? Yes, it's a human being. And yet, yes, we believe that that life should be able to be ended, that that baby should be able to be killed if the mother prefers that. Um, that is a that is a scary thing because it's no different than say and you know and this is not meant to to be particularly offensive although I know it will be this is not a lot different than many of the uh, those who have committed genocide in the past who simply draw those value distinctions somewhere different right, right. Uh, 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 Germans are you know blonde hair blue eyed Germans are more important than Jewish people yeah. um, you know is the most common you know uh, example of that that we use these days because yeah. we dealt with it you know in the last century and so we have we have that we also have uh, a, a growing um, our society is growing more towards and, and, and in Europe's ahead of us in this where we look at the quality of life because that's what you were talking about right the quality of life of this child mm-hmm. what's it going to be, which by the way, you could never know, but we look at the quality of life of the elderly and we say, you know, for instance, in Washington, where we're sitting right now and in Oregon, just South of us, we have laws in place that allow people to commit suicide under, um, a physician's care in certain circumstances, terminal illness and so on. And the, and the whole thing here is when the quality of life goes to a certain level, should you be able to ask your physician to kill you? But there's no question about what's happening. Mm-hmm. If physician assistant suicide is having your physician assist you in killing yourself and, mm-hmm. and ending your life. Um, and again, it's a freedom of choice thing, right? Except for the, the problem becomes especially with the way that healthcare is being viewed now, whatever you believe about healthcare, there's no question about one thing. It's very, very expensive. And so what, what is, many people think is inevitable is that at some point we will come to a place where at a certain age, someone else will determine whether your quality of life is worth doing that worth next. Worth the expense. Yeah, worth doing that next surgery, worth, do, worth giving you that particular uh, uh, drug that you need to maintain life or whatever, or whether it's time to just give you a, a very inexpensive pill that will end your life, right? And so while we're not there in the United States yet, uh, it's questionable. You can read about um, what they're saying is going on in some of the uh, Northern European countries concerning this issue. Um, but there, if you start saying that life is only valuable if it has a quality, right, that mm-hmm. is that determined by somebody else, um, that whether that quality is, is high enough. You know, I have a, I have a niece, who is who has schizencephaly? Who's my brother, uh, Danny Robinson? He's a pastor down in Austin, um, and uh, his his daughter's name is Emily, a beautiful um, young girl, and she has schizencephaly, and this is a brain disorder, and okay. essentially it it's you know she's missing a a part of her brain, um, and. You know, so because of that, she has a lot of challenges in, in life. And her parents, you know, my brother and his wife, Anna, um, who are there at a church down in, in Texas. He's a pastor. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, you can you can look him up if you want. It's Grace First Community Church in Austin, Texas. If you're listening down there, go give, go check out that church. Um, but, you know, it's, it's if <sighs> in this day and age, if they would have been able to tell in the womb, that that Emily would have had these problems, many parents would have said, that's that's too much work. She won't have a high enough quality of life and whatever. And the life of this beautiful girl would have never existed in the parent in the home of those parents. Um, now, that would have been my brother and his wife wouldn't have done that, but there are parents who would do it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, who is to say what Emily's quality of life is? Seems to me that she has a good time. You know, we go to Disney World together with them or whatever. Emily's having a great time. Her mm-hmm. quality of life does not seem low. Um, okay, so she so she can't do some of the things that this that this kid or that kid can do, but she's got her own, you know, she's she is valuable and precious in God's sight in her own way. And that's that's the Christian worldview. That's why we're against it. We believe that everyone has value. We would never end the life of a child in the womb. Now there are there are exceptions. For instance, what's called a tubal pregnancy, where the the egg is implanted within the tube, I assume the fallopian tube or whatever. And what's going to happen is both the baby won't live and the mother won't live. Right, right. And so there are there are always and always have been um, 
exceptions to what we would call homicide laws, uh, taking of a life, um, where there is true defense of self or others. And mm-hmm. so if you if the child is going to die and the mother is going to die, certainly the mother has the right to protect her actual living life from um, from death in a, certain, in a situation like that. Right. That is rare. It happens, but mm-hmm. it's very, very rare. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about in Ireland. That would have been legal in Ireland, I'm certain, that, yeah. that at tubal pregnancy, you could have, you could have um, had an abortion in that situation. And while sad, there's, it's, there's no it's way the around right it. Call. Yeah, there's yeah. no way around it. Um, but we're talking about abortion on demand. We're talking about um, birth control by abortion is essentially what we're talking about, where you've decided you don't want to have a child right now, and so you, you kill the child. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you have to come at that with a very, very particular view of morality and of the value of human life, or you can't make that judgment. Now, have you ever heard anybody, because usually you won't hear this in arguments. Like I say, this this takes place um, right now among those who are actually educated in the field and, uh, and, and in the state of the art of this debate is where the, what I'm talking about takes place, the mm-hmm. value of the mother versus the value of the mm-hmm. child. Have you ever had a debate with somebody where they were doing that or has it always been, no, no, it's not really a baby, it's a fetus? No, yeah, it, and I think in recent years more so it's been a, it's the the argument has developed because I, I think people, they try to say, oh no, it's not a baby for a little while. And then eventually they went, okay, I'm not, I'm not getting through with that argument anymore. It's, it's pretty clear that that's not a viable argument. Um, and so I do hear a lot of, um, quality of life arguments now. Um, in fact, I don't, I don't know if I've, the, the argument that I mentioned earlier where they were like, well, they were just being completely unreasonable and, and uh, I realized that pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and this is the nature of these kinds of debates: is is not only are they often done in in ways that don't make a lot of sense, they're done. It, they, there's a method to them that doesn't make a lot of sense. In other words, people have lost the art of argument, mm-hmm. and so I think people get really unreasonable really fast. And there's a lot of argument by volume. Yeah, um, how loud can I yell? Um, it was certainly that. It was I'm going to bring my friend into this argument and. We're just going bully to, up on you. Yeah, and it, it, there's just lots of vulgarity being used, and it was. I was like, okay, this. I actually, I actually wanted to have a legitimate. I didn't, I didn't want to hate you because you disagreed with me. I just want to have a legitimate conversation about this, and you pretty quickly turned that off. Right. So, um, but I have much more, um, I think, meaningful conversations now with people over whether or not um, the quality of life issue has validity, um, and and even with you know. You know, in my Christian circles, we just someone will, someone will play devil's advocate. You know, they'll they'll oppose the Christian worldview, even though they hold the Christian worldview. Um, they'll just oppose it, and we'll have conversations like that. And uh, those are at least more meaningful conversations now that I yeah. have. I have no problem with people who are struggling through an issue and trying to discover it. I actually think that when it comes to these issues, um, the believer and the unbeliever alike can find common ground. In the sense that morality, while while we understand it from Scripture mm-hmm. as believers, and that's where and that's where we go to for it, it's actually something that can be understood uh, by everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a passage, and I've probably um, I don't know if I've if I've gone to this passage on this. You're going to Romans two, aren't I am. you? I'm gonna go to Romans two because I think that here is where we find our our sort of common ground, and uh, that's Acts two. Well, what do you know? Which I is turned, similar. I turned to Acts. Go figure, <laughs> right? Um, we've only been in Acts for a couple of years. So it says this. It says, for when Gentiles, which is just for those of you who don't read the Bible a lot, Gentiles is, is you unless you're Jewish, okay? Everybody who's not Jew. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, okay? And, and when he's talking about that, he's talking about Scripture, right? They don't have... They don't have the scripture. They haven't grown up with uh, with the traditions of Judaism, Christianity. Um, it says when they do not those for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing, or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, essentially, what the scripture is saying is everybody, everybody has the work of the law written on their hearts. 
that, that you cannot get away from it. And before you come back with, well, I don't feel guilty and my conscience isn't telling me just to slow down for a second because there's a lot of stuff before that that would explain why your conscience may not be working right. Um, those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness eventually have essentially a seared conscience and don't understand things. And that's all of us short of being you know drawn by, by, by the Spirit to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's but let's slow the whole the whole world down. I actually do believe that those who are advocating for abortion are often doing so with a moral argument, which is to say, I don't think that you have, you know, these people on one side, lots of them are Christians, but there are non-Christians who believe abortion is wrong. Um, but there are people who, who are from all kinds of religions and from no religion at all that recognize abortion as murder. Uh, that's not, you know, as killing a baby. So that's, that is what it is. But I do believe that those who are on the quote unquote other side, who would say, you know, the wife of the life of the mother versus life of the child and whatever, they're all making moral arguments. They're all using moral language. They're all they're trying to do what they believe is right. I have no question about most people who are coming in are trying to protect something. And what what's happened is is that different priorities and different and different ways of viewing things have have muddied the water for them. Mm-hmm. And so, first of all, if you don't believe if you are not convinced in your in your spirit in your heart that human beings are valuable okay that they have a value that is that is different in kind from any any other living thing animals plants whatever that there is there is no other living thing um, on on the earth you know short of god that has the value of a human being if you believe something other than that then of course you're going to then take that those are going to be the lenses, the goggles that you're wearing when you come into the abortion debate. And you're going to say, now, hang on a second. Human life is like animal life. I'm going to judge it that way. Mm-hmm. Or this life might be worth more than that life. The life of my kid is worth more than the life of your, whatever it is, okay? And this explains many of the wars and the, and the fighting and the difficulties and whatever that have always gone on. But let me be clear about something. If you believe that, and I just want you to check this. Forget about abortion for a second. If you believe that human life is not intrinsically valuable because it's human life, you don't believe that there's a God or you don't believe that God has made people in his image and likeness, you are not only going to be probably on the other side of this debate on abortion, you are going to find yourself at the end of that philosophical road believing in all kinds of things that right now you would call despicable. But the fact is, is that if you don't hold that first view about the value of human life, you simply don't have the philosophical, you know, the intellectual uh, ability to later on defend things like genocide and so on. Which when you say you don't have the intellectual ability, you're not saying that you're stupid. You're saying you don't, you couldn't. You don't have a basis. You couldn't intellectually, you couldn't be intellectually honest and. That's condemn I mean. those things. Yes. Yes. You could not intellectually honestly condemn genocide right. if you will not intellectually honestly condemn um, abortion. And now your your reaction may be right now, if you're listening to this and, and you disagree with me, is how dare you say that you don't know me, whatever. Listen, it has nothing to do with you. Don't get don't which get, I'm comforted that you're reacting that way. Yeah. If but, you weren't reacting yeah, that way, that's I, good. I'd be because I believe you. that you think that those other things are wrong. My argument is not that those other things that you don't believe those other things are wrong. I think you do believe they're wrong. My argument is that if you believe those things are wrong, you gotta back that philosophical journey up and recognize that you also should believe that abortion is wrong. You cannot say abortion is okay which must, by its nature, in any kind of moral argument, make a judgment about the value of the life of a human being Mm -hmm. as being less than another human being. You cannot do it otherwise. It's not possible for you to say a woman should have... And many people will say some things like, I would never get an abortion, but I think that women should have the right to choose. Mm -hmm. I can say, I can use that same language and say a million things like, I would never murder Hunter, but I think that Taylor, his wife, should have the right to choose to murder Hunter. Which maybe. Which I do agree with that, but that's a different issue (laughs) altogether. Oh, no. Right? No, I I don't. Taylor, don't don't do it. Um, I know you want to. She was just waiting for the push, She's just waiting. It's like, well, the pastor said so, right? Um, I don't don't think that. But, But listen, you... The person who's listening to this right now, if you if, you've, if you put up with it for this long, you cannot both believe that a woman should have the right to choose to to kill her child that's in utero, and say that the person who thinks that uh, you know some other race or some other type of people or people who do this or those people over there or those people over there that those people who, that the people who say those people shouldn't live, you can't condemn them and justify 
the the mother who who wants to end a pregnancy. Now, again, remember, I, this is not about causing shame and, and guilt to those who have had abortions. I just want I really really want to emphasize that I have an incredible heart. I could tell you my own story uh, about you know my wife and I, and and if you want to go back actually and look, we have a uh, there's a I did a a sermon on this. I want to say January of 2016. Um, and it's on, I think it's Sanctity of Human Life uh, Sunday. It might be called that. And it's either on YouTube or it's on uh, Vimeo. I don't know. Um, but but we, we'll try to, we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, there's, a, there's a thing. And you can hear my story, my own personal story. So uh, I have my own, my own guilt and shame that came over this that's been redeemed by Jesus Christ that you can, that you can hear about so that you know that I'm not just some, you know, uh, you know quote unquote, uh, straight white male, you know, trying to dominate people with my own ideas. I have my own things that I've dealt with on this and that the Lord has brought me through. So just being clear about that. But, but let me make sure that you understand. I'm going to say it again. You cannot believe that there are value differences between different human beings or that human beings don't have value and have a legitimate moral objection to genocide and other forms of horrific oppression against human beings. Yeah, they, human beings are either valuable and, and have equality and value, male, female, any race, any, any gender, any race, any person that we all have value, either have to believe that. In which case, you cannot believe that it would be okay to kill a child in utero, or you don't believe it, in which case you have no justification intellectually to believe that other people who are doing horrible things in other places or, or around or, or near you are doing something wrong. And that's, and that's a stark reality that you need to face. And, and you may disagree with me about this, but your disagreement does not mean that you're right. Uh, yeah, this is an issue that I believe is, you know, that philosophically is very easy to defend from my side and that you may emotionally disagree with me, but just because you want to both quote unquote, believe in the rights of uh, mothers to kill their children, um, just because you want to believe that and also condemn other acts that are similar from an ethical perspective does not mean that you can justify doing that. Okay, and, these, and, and, and I'm not saying this to be hard and harsh and whatever. I'm saying it because it's true. Okay, and, and my obligation is not to make you like me. My obligation is, although I, I hope that you do, um, I like you. My obligation is not to um, make sure that you're comfortable all the time, but my obligation is to speak the truth. And so that's what I'm doing. And I, and I want you to know that I'm doing it in love. I really want you to see the reality and really sit back and not just listen to what I'm saying, but really sit back and search your own heart and your own conscience about these issues and, and do the philosophical work, do the theological work, do the work to make sure that your worldview about these things is consistent. Because if you don't, then what you'll find is you believe all kinds of things that you can't justify believing. So, Hunter, I want to let you uh, give me your thoughts on, um, you know, what you what you see, and I'll talk about what I see as kind of the future of, you know, now that Ireland has sort of that's a domino that's fallen. Uh, you know, what do you see for for the world moving forward on issues of the value of human life, abortion, euthanasia, which is um, physician-assisted suicide, so on and so forth. How do you see this affecting your generation? How do you see this affecting the people who you're around? Oh, I don't want, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> you know, it's really easy to be cynical about it. Um, I try to hope for uh, a shift because I think I, I see people, I, I think I think people are moving in a direction that they don't quite see the end of the road of. But as they as they round the bend and they see what the end of that road looks like, I think um, some or all are going to rebel against that that direction. Um, hopefully, you know, I hope that's my my hope. Um, and you know, my hope is that people will realize it right now and 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 turn away from just just the scary implications of. Um, well, and certainly, you know, I hope people, I hope people first come to know God, and that, and by that, they then conclude that um, human. If we're looking at the idea of human life, the sanctity of human life, um, I hope that they encounter God, and that that changes their worldview on that. But I think that um, people, even though uh, they don't believe in God, they can still value the sanctity of human life, 
And so I hope that people um, very quickly realize that uh, that the road that they're headed down uh, philosophically and practically is not um, healthy for humans, not healthy uh, for this world, and it's uh, dangerous. Um, I did have, there, as we were talking earlier, I had a question. So the Eighth Amendment, you said, stated that the life of the mother and the life of the baby were equal, correct? Correct. Okay, so that kind of got me thinking. Um, and, and we talked about, uh, I don't remember. What, what, That's the Irish Eighth Amendment. The U.S. Eighth Amendment is about cruel and unusual punishment. Yes. So. Let's talk about that now. Um, just kidding. Um, we So you talked about um, terminating a, a pregnancy that was going to result in death both for the baby and the mother. Correct. Um, what about a pregnancy that the baby could be born, but it was we'll just say 75% likely that the mother was going to die in the, in birth giving. Right. Um, where do you stand on that? Cause that's something that I, I think I know my position on. Yeah. So, so I want to be clear about one thing before I answer this question. We're at the margins, right? We're at the margins of this question. We start answering questions about incest or rape or, or the life of the mother right. at risk or whatever. And you have to be really careful with, with arguments like this, that you don't end up having them out at the margins and, and therefore allowing the middle to become muddled. The right. middle is very clear, or the, or the main thrust of this argument is very clear. Out at the margins, we can have these conversations, and we will, and I'm going to answer your question. But I just want to be really clear that whatever the answer is that I give over here, it is it is based on the same morality, and mm-hmm. it's consistent ethically with what I'm saying about abortion being wrong over here. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I also, before I answer this, I, I want to be clear again that um, there are so many... Um, opportunities out there for women and families, not men and women, you know, um, fathers and mothers of unborn children. Uh, and, and again, Pathways Pregnancy Center, I want to I want to hit them up again. We'll put their um, uh, website in the show notes. If you, if you have a question you want to get to them or if you're not in this area, I'd still go check them out or call them and they can find you uh, another CareNet resource that's in your area. They're all over the country. And so we will put that in the show notes. Uh, but let me let me answer your question. And, and the way I answer it is uh, from classic uh, legal uh, framework, okay? And so here's, here's the legal framework. Let's say that I have a gun and that I have it aimed at you. Mm-hmm. And I have a 75% chance of killing you, okay? okay. And w- w- me with a gun, if you've ever seen me target shooting, you know that it's probably it's less 75%. Than, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I mean, I'm 20 feet away and I'm aiming a handgun at you. Do you have the right to defend yourself? I I hope so. Yeah, sure. You, do, right? <laughs> you have the right to to if you could push a button mm-hmm. that could, that would end my life and save yours, you would have the legal right to do that and and the moral right. You mm-hmm. have a right to protect yourself. Okay? Right. Um, and and I want to get into issues. Uh, it's a whole nother issue to mm-hmm. get into issues of of uh, whether or not there's ever a justification for using violence. Okay, that's a that's its own set of things. There are some people, both believers, unbelievers, that are pacifists that believe that you just have to let the person shoot you and so on. Uh, suffice it to say, I disagree with that position. I but we but I don't have time to get into that. So let's just talk about the right to defend oneself. Okay. The right to defense of self and others is an absolute right. Um, it's assuming that you actually have it. And, and you have it when there is a high percentage chance that there's an action that's being taken against you that will end your life. And so mm-hmm. I believe that a mother has the right in this, uh, that, that if uh, you know, you're sitting, you and your wife, you got three children and your wife's pregnant and the doctor comes to you and says, um, 75% chance that if you go through with this pregnancy and have this child, that you, it will end your life. You know, the child will live, but there's a 75% chance that you won't. I believe that at that point, a mother has a, that's, that's where a, a mother truly has a right to decide whether to exercise her right to self-defense, mm-hmm. defending herself from death or having a child. Now, I will say this. I think that is so exceedingly rare with medical technology no where it is, it is right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you can have a C-section. You know, ha- natural childbirth is not the only way to have a child now. You can have a C-section. You can. There's all kinds of things. We, our second child, it was very, very difficult birth. We had a lot of stuff that we had to go through. It was actually very scary um, and, and whatever, but they were able to do it. And, and he's alive and, and living and playing drums on Sunday mornings. And so, <laughs> um, you know, he's 15 years old now and everything's great. But there, at this point... Medical science has come to the point where I think it's probably exceedingly, exceedingly rare that you would be given that ultimatum. 
you know, 75% chance that you're, that you'll die, you know, if you go through this pregnancy. But if they did, I think you would have the same right that someone who had a gun aimed at them with 75% chance of it killing them would have. You always have the right to defend yourself from, you know, almost certain death. Okay. That's just a right of self-defense. And so, yes, I would not think that somebody had done something morally wrong to protect their life in a situation where it was threatened to that level. Now, I also think that many, many mothers would take the risk. Right. Um, and, yeah. and that's and that's fine, too, that you have a right to also risk your life to save a life yeah. in, in this case, right? And so I think that that while I find it exceedingly rare, I don't think that there is a wrong choice in a situation where you truly are at risk of dying. Not there's a one in a million chance, not there's a one in a hundred chance. There's a you know, 75, 80, 90 percent chance you're going to die if you if you uh, you know have this child, then I think you have a right to self-defense, you know, of your body. I just think it's so exceedingly rare and so at the margins that it's almost not worth talking about. But if that's if that's a situation you're in, I think very few people would tell you, no, 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 you have to sacrifice your life so that this child could live. Now, I do think, in fact, my own grandmother. Um, I believe, see, and, and again, I, and I'm not positive about this. My, you know, my dad told me this story some time ago, but uh, with maybe maybe the last child she had, they told her that you know it was likely to kill her. Now this is many many years ago, mm. and she chose to go and have and go through the, the pregnancy and, and have and have the child anyway, um, and she didn't die. She's still alive. Um, shout out to grandma. That's good. So that was a know, happy ending. That's, <laughs> and that's a choice that she was able to make for herself. Right. That's mm-hmm. that's that's. A choice. That's right. a real choice. In other words, I'm at, a, I'm at a neutral moral choice. I have every right to choose to defend my own life. I also have every right to choose to give my life up for the sake of my child. Um, and both choices are open to me and both choices are, are morally neutral compared to one another. That is a very different thing than... There's no reason to believe that I'm going to have a problem having this child, um, and I don't want and I don't want to have a child for whatever reason. Fill in the blank. Yeah, it's not the child I wanted. It's got uh, you know a, a a physical problem or a mental problem that's going to that's that's clear from the ultrasounds and so on. So I don't wait, or I don't have enough money, or hey, I want to go to college, or hey, I want it. Whatever it is, right? We don't want another kid. We don't want you know. Those are not morally neutral choices. Right. Mm-hmm. What? And maybe I am going way to the margins again, but you know it's just it's it's more of a philosophical exercise. Um, well, I don't know how far this is on the margins. What if it's a mother who is completely in poverty, and having a child puts a real risk on her being able to feed herself and the child? I, I think that that there are many, many, many circumstances where adoption is the Right, right. Is the yeah. right the right way to go. Right. Is is a good choice for both the mother and the child. Many, many, many circumstances where where you truly are not going to be able to care for a child. Maybe you're thirteen years old, you yeah. know, um, maybe whatever. And and adoption is absolutely the right way to go. Um, they even have open adoptions where you can't care as the nor- as the regular caregiver mother, but you can still be in the life as the biological mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and another family wants to adopt. There's so many families out there who want to adopt children. Um, and so I think that adoption is beautiful. I think it's it's godly. I think it's wonderful, both in, both for the adopting family who's adopting the child, and for the mother who sometimes has to make the hard choice to give the child up for adoption. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's what puts the child in the best in the best chance to thrive, um, I think that's a good choice. That is a very different thing than than the choice to end the child's right, life. Right. 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 Yeah. Any more? Uh, All right. That's as far I mean, as we go. There are me. obviously, you know, some of the classic uh, examples are things like rape and incest and things like that. And my my general um, answer to that is one that some people don't like, which is, you know, those are incredibly unfortunate circumstances, but they do not rise to the level of making of justifying killing a baby. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I can walk through that more at some point um, if, it, you know, again, uh, Axe Church Q&A, if you want to ask questions about it, hashtag Axe Church, Axe Church Q&A, that's A-C-T-S, not A-X-E, by the way, um, not a sponsor, Axe Deodorant or whatever that stuff is, <laughs> um, Axe as an Axe in the Bible, Church Q&A, if you want to ask, uh, Axe, if you want to ask some questions um, to <laughs> access us, anything. access anything you want, and... Uh, 
Not, uh, don't not access anything you want. Ask us anything you want, and we would be uh, happy to um, to go further. It's it's very hard in a podcast like this, and this in the way that we do it, to uh, really really get to the bottom of all these issues. And I thought we might get further today than we did. And I could go on and on and on about the issues of uh, you know morality related to um, abortion and so on. Like I say, we'll put the the. Um, the post of that sermon in the show notes. We'll also put um, uh, the pregnancy center here in the local one here in the Kamaswa Shugal area pathways in the show notes that you guys can get a hold of them. And I really, really encourage you, whether you're a mother who had an abortion and and needs to work through, um, you know, shame and guilt and difficulties, you know, from that, uh, look, Jesus has peace and love and redemption and forgiveness for you. Whether you're someone who's struggling with, should I make the decision to have to have this child or to not have this child? Again, you know, Axe Church is, is a place you can get Pathways Pregnancy Center, or or if you're somewhere else in the country, a local pregnancy center that's uh, you know part of the Care Net group um, would be a great place to go, um, and, and we can help you find those resources if you need those resources. Just to counsel with somebody who's not going to judge you, who's just going to walk you through. Um, you can get an ultrasound at a lot of these places, and they can they can show you sort of what's going on with this pregnancy. So you have a better idea of of what's really happening, which is a beautiful. I mean, the thing we're we're missing in talking about the death side is the beautiful the beauty of the life side of, of human beings made in the image and likeness of God that we have been granted the, the amazing, amazing, um, just blessing and gift of being able to have children and be able to raise children and to, and to love children. And so we do love children at Acts Church, uh, you, both your children and our children. And, and we just, we pray that uh, you would you would see this issue for what it is and that we would walk forward as a society um, that values life because I do, you know, my, my view of what will happen if we don't arrest this, um, situation, if we don't, if we don't start turning back the other direction on the issue of life, I do believe that we will come to the point where life will become more and more and more devalued until those who have, um, what they would consider a greater claim on life will be dominating those who they consider to have less of a claim on life, whether that's infants, whether that's uh, older people, or whether that's just people who disagree with them or people who look differently than them or whatever it is. And we've seen this happen in history, and we will certainly see it again as we're seeing it now if we do not start to value life the way we ought to and start to live the way that Christ has called us to live. And so let's uh, let's pray, and uh, we'll we'll see you next week. Father, we just... We thank you for babies. Uh, we thank you for marriage and family and the beauty of the opportunity to raise children, Lord. And we just we pray for Ireland. We pray for the United States. We pray for Europe and China. And we pray for all these countries all over the world, Lord, where, uh, where children are, their lives are ended, snuffed out in the womb. Lord, we, we greatly desire not to bring shame and guilt to people, but to bring hope and peace and joy, uh, Lord, through the life that you bring through children. Uh, and, and not every child uh, has to meet some some uh, standard of perfection to be worthy of being born, Lord, but beautiful children like my niece Emily and so many others, Lord, that, that may have some struggles in their lives are just such a wonderful blessing to us and to their families. And we just pray, Lord, that life would be would be valued all over, not just babies, um, but people who are oppressed all over the world, people who are struggling. That people would start to see their neighbors as as valuable as themselves and love their neighbor as themselves, whatever that neighbor looks like, whatever that whatever group that neighbor is a part of, whatever um, political ideology they have. How no matter how big they are, how young they are, how old they are, that we would just value people, Lord, because we know that you love people so much. And I just pray that everyone who's listening today would know how much you love them. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to, to do this podcast and to, and to speak to people uh, on issues. And we just pray you'd be with us this week in your name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this Axe Church podcast. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can use that hashtag Axe Church Q&A, and we'd love to look at those and answer some of them. It really helps us get engaging content for those who are listening to our podcast, helps us understand what's on your mind, what's pressing in your life, um, and, and gives us something to talk about. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next time.